I'm excited for today. It's, it's Mother's Day. It is sunny and like warm outside and the air conditioning is working. It feels glorious in here right now. So I, it, it's the small things, right? You got to celebrate the small things and then they just kind of add up to a life of joy, something like that. I don't know. Just kind of made it up on the spot. Hey, um, I'm excited for this series that we're in. This is week three of this series, Entrusted with Every Moment. And here's what kind of blows my mind about this truth that we see in God's Word. See, I think most of us are, are, are okay with the idea that, hey, we, we entrust certain things to God. Our, our hopes, our futures, different dreams, our, our provision maybe. Like we trust God with those things because, well, he's, he's, he's God. I mean, he's perfect. He's got a great track record, right? I mean, like he knows what he's doing. He's the creator of the universe. And so we, we can entrust him with these things that are very special and valuable to us. But then... The reverse of that, that God would entrust something to me, blows my mind. Because I know me. I, I know my track record. I know my ups and downs and my inconsistencies. So the fact that God would entrust things to me that are important to him is, is crazy. But, but God has entrusted relationships abilities and gifts, resources, time and talent. I mean, just people around us. He's entrusted his kingdom to us. That, that's how God has chosen to grow his kingdom is through you and me. That blows my mind because he could choose to reach this world any way he wanted to. He could send out a legion of angels and just take care of all of it. Or he could speak to everyone through a burning bush. But he's like, no, I'm going to go through those imperfect, messed up people that kind of get screwed up all the time. Like That, that just blows my mind. Here, here's, here's a verse that captures... The heart of this, um, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, um, Paul, who's an early church leader, is writing to a younger leader named Timothy. And here's what he says in verse 14. It says, Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. So God's entrusted something to you that is precious to him. I let that sink in for a moment. I don't know about you, but I'm like, oh, that's a lot of pressure, right? Like, God, like, wow, I don't want to disappoint God. I mean, like, it's one thing to disappoint someone I care about who's with me, but God, I definitely don't want to disappoint God. He's entrusted something. Here's what it's, when it says guard, it's not talking about just, just keep it safe. It's talking about more than just protect it, more than just don't lose it. Guard, that original word actually means to use it in a way that would best honor and please the one who gave it to you. And we're going to look at a passage that shows God's heart for what he wants or expects of us with what he's entrusted to us. Before we do that, I have an apple. Um, it's a snack for all of us to share. I'm going to take a bite. No, I'm joking. Um, no, I mean, it's an interesting thing about apples. I don't know if you've heard this before. Um, a phrase. I think I heard it as a kid. Um, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Hey, you've heard it too. Cool. And, and I, I, I realized something weird because... I don't know if, where I first saw it, whether it was in a book or like a movie or something, but I always see like the kid walk in to school and give his teacher an apple. I'm like, well, that's weird. I know teachers don't make a lot of money, but I think they can afford apples. Like, what's the deal with the, giving the teacher an apple? And I realized, well, if an apple a day keeps the doctor away, teachers are surrounded by kids all day, and, and kids are just like this cesspool for like every bug, every virus, every fever, like, man, it's like gone through our family like five times this year, I swear. It's like, oh, we're trying to protect the teachers with the apple. Now I get it. Okay. Another interesting thing about apples is um, I, I read this somewhere as well, that in the morning, wake up, eat an apple. It's actually more effective to give you energy and keep you energized uh, longer than a cup of coffee. Interesting fact there. So if you want to kick your caffeine addiction, um, you can have an apple tomorrow morning. Um, I personally um, am not addicted. I can quit anytime I want, so I'm going to continue to enjoy my coffee. Um, but if you're feeling convicted by that, grab an apple. Um, but interesting thing about apples, about a lot of fruit, um, is what's inside? What's inside an apple? You guys probably can't see this unless you're like in the front row here, but what, what's inside an apple? Seeds, right? So while an apple has immense value in that it can bring nourishment, it's healthy, it's flavorful, um, it it's also has something within itself, the ability to not just 
reproduce another apple, but think about the capacity of a single seed in this apple. One seed can produce another apple tree. And I'm not like a plant guy, so I don't know how long it takes for a tree to begin to produce fruit, but I know eventually that tree is going to produce not just one, but several harvests of apples that will all have seeds inside of them that can produce more and more apple trees and more and more apples. So I don't know, I mean, within one apple, there's the capacity for like orchards and orchards and orchards, millions, billions of other apples. And the same is true in our lives, and you can think about an apple. Yes, God has called us to, as people who follow Jesus, to bring life to this world, to bring flavor, to bring health, to bring vitality, to bring energy by the Spirit of God inside of us. Yes, those things are true, and God has called us to reproduce what he's done in us, what he is doing inside of us in the lives of others. God, like an apple, the way he's made and designed an apple, he's made and designed us, he expects us to multiply. God's entrusted us with his kingdom and he entrusts us with it, not just to not lose it, not just to not mess it up, but actually to advance it, to multiply it. Now, I say that word multiply. I know right away some of us just kind of lock up and we're like, uh, multiply, like that's, that's a scary word, like I don't know about that. And you, maybe you, you just feel pressure, like, oh, it's something else I have to do. I'll add that to the list of everything else I'm trying to do to kind of live this Christian life and do the right things. My hope today is, if there's one thing that happens today, here's my hope, is that every single one of us today would leave with an excitement around the fact that God wants to work in you and through you to multiply his kingdom. That wouldn't be pressure, it wouldn't be a burden, it wouldn't be one more, th- one more thing to add to your plate, but there would be immense excitement as we walk through God's word together. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 is a series of stories that Jesus tells about his kingdom, more specifically, um, kind of this moment in his kingdom when, when he comes back, this moment called like the, the final judgment, where he's going to basically call every single one of us to give an account for the lives we live. And I want all of us to be equipped for that conversation, to walk in, we get to see Jesus face to face and give an account with a ton of excitement. Not fear, not insecurity, not wondering what is he gonna say, but excited. And that's my hope for us today. And I recognize there's some of us in the room, you don't follow Jesus. You are here, let's be straight, it's Mother's Day, right? Mom gets her way on Mother's Day. That's why you're in church. So I recognize that dynamic. There's some of us that, hey, you know what? I'm not sure what I think about Jesus, church, all this. Man, I'm so excited you're here. I believe God is going to encourage you as well. And I'm thrilled that you're here to walk on this journey with us. So let's dive in. Matthew chapter 25, we're gonna start in verse 14. So this is Jesus speaking, and he's telling the story to his disciples. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. 
I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I'm going to look at a couple of general observations about this story together before we dive into the, the characters specifically. The first thing is this. Each of the servants receives a different amount, right? One gets five, one gets two, one gets one. But each one receives something of significance. Because even the one bag of silver, actually the Bible calls it a talent. It was an amount of money. It was not a small amount. It wasn't like, hey, here's five bucks. Go, go buy lunch. No, I mean, it was, it was a significant amount of money that you would have to work for a long time to, to actually have this amount of money saved up. So even the one who received the one bag of silver received a significant amount. So here's what I want you to hear in this, every single one of us, is that you have received something significant. Because I don't know about, we, we do this so often as people where we look at, well, I have one. He got five. Therefore, I must not be as important as he is. Or, or I, I must not be as valuable because I don't have that kind of talent. The things that I can do, they, they don't make as much of an impact. That's not how God sees it at all. He sees every single one of us as unique people that he's created with intentionality and purpose. Like he, he's created you to be you, not to be somebody else. And the more you and I compare ourselves and, well, if I just was more like that person, man, that's, that's misery. Because the greatest joy is found not in trying to be someone else, but discovering who God's made you to be and living from that design. So God has given you unique gifts, passions, pieces of your personality, opportunities, relationships, resources, and, and he wants to see how you're going to use those things for his kingdom. He's not worried about how you're going to measure up to someone else. That's something that we place on ourselves. God does not place comparison on us. So everyone receives something significant, even the one that received the one back. The other piece I want us to see is that this parable is illustrated in, in, with money, but that's just an analogy. Don't get caught up on the money. It's not about the money, as we'll see here in just a little bit. The master in this story, he, he gives something to each of his servants, and then he leaves on a journey. We don't know how long. It says that he's gone for a long time, and after that, he returns. The connection is this. is Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He raised up men to, to, to lead his church, men and women who are going to carry their faith throughout the world, and his church began to take off. Well, he lived that perfect life. He laid down his life, allowed himself to be murdered, and then he rose from the grave and eventually ascended back to heaven. And it says that he's in heaven now at the right hand of the Father, but that he's coming back someday to take home all who belong to him. So every single one of us who have faith in Jesus, we know that Jesus is coming back someday. It could be in an hour, it could be in a day, it could be in a month, it could be in a thousand years. We don't know when, but Jesus is coming back. And like the master, he's going to come back and every single one of us are going to give an account and it's going to be an individual account. Notice how, yeah, there's three servants, but the master doesn't call them together and say, okay, all right, so between all three of you, I gave you eight. What did what, you bring back collectively? Fifteen? Hey, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good return. No, he says, hey, I gave you five. Tell, tell me what that, what, what that, what that looked like. What, what happened with the five I entrusted to you? Hey, what happened to the two I entrusted? Hey, where's the one I entrusted to you? I mean, this when, when every single one of us stand before Jesus someday, the question is not going to be, hey, what did your church do? Hey, what about your family? Even though, yes, you are responsible in part for your family. It's going to be, hey, your life, your individual life. God cares so much about you that he's going to ask you specifically. Every single one of us, hey, what, what did you do with the life I gave you? With the gifts, the passions, the abilities that I birthed inside you? 
the opportunities that you had at your disposal? What would you do with those things? And again, my hope is that we would, like these first two servants, hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now we would look forward to this conversation with some excitement. So let's look at these first two servants. They're greeted this way when, when they come back. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. So my question is this for you. For, when you think about you making an impact in God's kingdom, what qualities are you using to, to measure yourself? Because Jesus doesn't say, well done, my educated and gifted servant. He doesn't say, well done, my perfect and skilled servant. Good and faithful are the qualities he cares about. Good, good means this. You and I being good towards God and good towards people means loving God well with all of our hearts and loving people sacrificially, not with an ulterior motive. That's what it means to be good. Being faithful, being faithful means being fruitful. Faithful, again, it's, it's not just protecting what we've been given and making sure it doesn't go away or we don't squander it. Otherwise, all three servants would have been faithful. The first two, the ones that were fruitful, who invested well, who sowed well what God had entrusted, they were the ones that were called faithful. So God's asking us to be good and faithful, to to be genuine and pure in our motives, and then to look for opportunities to sow into others, to invest in others. And God expects us to multiply and look for opportunities at how we can do that. One of my favorite quotes, one that's brought me a lot of freedom as I've wrestled through insecurity and lack of confidence in the past and wondering, like, what's God called me to and can God really work through me? If you've ever wondered about that because of maybe an insecurity around your past or your lack of experience, whatever it might be, uh, Rick Yancey says it this way. He says, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Here's what that means. If you and I have entered into a relationship with Jesus, we are called to make an impact in God's kingdom. We are called to multiply, every single one of us. God's not waiting for you and I to get to the spot of perfection. He's like, oh, hey, now I, can use, now I can work through you. Now you can actually make an impact. No, God says from day one, hey, I'm calling you to make an impact. Hey, it's, it's gonna be kind of bumpy along the way, but man, there's gonna be some growth opportunities. Don't wait until you have all the answers. Don't wait until you have it all figured out, until you have all the right experiences. Man, just, just start and believe that I'm going to empower you along the way. Here's the way it says it in 2 Peter. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. God has given you everything you need for living a godly life. Here's what that means. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, I will send the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the one who's gonna walk with you, guide you, teach you, instruct you, and and mold you and shape you, help you become who I've created you to be. And so God has placed his spirit inside you if you have responded to the gospel, and his Holy Spirit will equip you for every single opportunity he places in front of you. You and I have to walk in, in faith and believing that God's spirit really is enough to equip us for every single opportunity he places in front of us. And here's the thing, that the more unequipped we are in ourselves, the more glory it means for God. Because if it was all about our gifts and our abilities and our skills and how good we are, then it'd be like, oh, wow, that person is really amazing. Instead of, that person's kind of average. The God must be amazing, right? And that's the category I fit in. I'm not spectacular in myself, but I know who God is and I know the work he wants to do in my life and through me. And so we walk in faith believing that the Holy Spirit will instruct us every step of the way. I love the outcome for these servants. They receive praise from their master. They receive the promise of future blessing and more opportunities for multiplication. He says, okay, you've been faithful in this little amount. I'm gonna entrust you with more. And they're invited to celebrate. He said, let's celebrate together. Multiplication leads to great joy in our lives. All of us are looking for joy. I don't think there's anyone in the room that says, I, I don't really want joy. I just want like mediocre, like just kind of depression. I mean, like, no, no, we all want joy in our lives. Maybe you're not experiencing that right now, but I believe you want it. Multiplication leads to great joy. Parents in the room, think about it this way. And there is nothing more exciting as a parent than watching one of your kids, and you see certain 
pieces of their personality, certain things that just come naturally to them. Maybe there's, there's really compassion. They can walk in a room and notice when another kid is, is having a hard day and they just can just go and just sit with them and start playing with them and, and immediately they just brighten that kid's day. Or maybe it's a, a kind of a more of a mental skill they have that math just makes sense and comes easy to them and numbers just like start to click or it's an athletic ability and they excel at soccer or basketball or something like that. But when you see them discover what they're gifted in and begin to live from that gifting, man, that is so exciting as a parent to watch your child be who God made them to be. There's joy in that. And that's how God feels it towards us. When he looks at us and sees us living the lives he's called us to live and becoming the people he's called us to be, again, not comparing ourselves and should I be more like them or more like them, but discovering who God's made each of us to be and then living from that spot, that identity, man, it brings him so much joy. And so we get to experience that with our physical kids, yes, but also God's saying, hey, I'm inviting you to experience that in a spiritual sense. As you sow and invest in the lives of others spiritually, Man, you're going to be invited to celebrate and experience the joy that God experiences when he sees people live according to their designs. We get to pour into them. You know, I think about uh, the last servant and, and what, what made him different than the first two. One, I think, a huge piece is his view of the master. He says, well, I knew you were a harsh man. I knew you were, you know, kind of demanding more than was owed to you, and so I just didn't want to disappoint you, so I just buried it in the ground. His view of the master, and so for us, really, we have to ask ourselves, now, what's, what's my view of God? What's your view of God? Because this entire conversation really hinges on this question. If you and I look at God and we see, that, man, God is good. He loves us. He wants the best for us. That true joy is found in knowing him and following him. And we think about multiplication, we're like, man, I want as many people as possible to know God the way I get to know God. But if we see God as this tyrant who's always disappointed with us and he's angry with us and he's keeping a record of everything we do and say that's wrong and, and he's just waiting to just squash us or say, you know what, I'm, I'm done with you, then we are terrified to mess up, but that's not who God is. Some of us have, have bought into that lie that we think God's just disappointed with us and he just endures us because he has to. That's not who God is. And God loves us and wants the best for us. And so we can approach this conversation with a lot of excitement, not with fear, because, see, this lazy servant, he feared failure too much and he didn't fear his master enough. He, he allowed his fear of failure to paralyze him. And I think I know I do the same thing. You and I do the same thing at times. We're so afraid of messing up, of disappointing God. Uh, we just like, well, I, if I don't try, then I can't mess anything up. Here's the thing that we see in this story. Failure is not messing up. Failure is not trying. I mean, think about what, what do you tell your kids if they're scared of something? You don't tell them to play it safe. Well, if you're scared, you better not do it. Ever. Right? But how often does that our approach with God is because we're afraid or scared of something, they're like, well, if I don't try, then I can't fail. And if I, can't, if I don't fail, then God won't be disappointed with me. Here's, I want to change the way we think about failure. Here's the thing. God's big enough to handle your failure. It doesn't scare him. You're going to fail, and that doesn't scare God. Other people are going to fail, and that doesn't scare God. The original disciples, the 12 guys who Jesus poured his life into, failed over and over and over again. That's how they learned. Man, I love it. Peter, in one moment, he's confessing, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, because this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And like two sentences later, Peter pulls Jesus aside and, and basically tries to correct Jesus. Wouldn't recommend that one, right? <laughs> and Jesus calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. I'm like, talk about a failure, Jesus just called you Satan. Like, it doesn't get much lower than that. And Peter went on to lead the church. Now he failed. Man, there's, there's a time when the disciples are all proud because they think they did, like, you know, really did a good job. They tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, we saw someone teaching in your name. We told him to stop because he wasn't with us. Jesus is like, are you kidding me? He's telling people about the good news of the kingdom of God. You told him to stop? Like, no, 
if, if someone isn't against us, they're for us. Like, you're missing it. It's not about our little crew right here. Or another time, they're walking by, and they try to enter this village, and people don't want them to come in. They actually say, no, you're not welcome here. And one of the disciples is like, hey, Jesus, you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy everyone in the village? You know, they, they thought it was like a brilliant idea, and Jesus is like, oh, you are so missing it. Like, that is not my heart at all. Or my favorite, all the parents are, are bringing their kids to be blessed by Jesus. I mean, who... who Jesus is right there. Of course you want your kid to be prayed over, be blessed by Jesus. And the disciples actually shoo the kids away on Mother's Day. I don't know if it was Mother's Day, but that's the way I see it happening in my head. Um, I mean, they messed up, right? If the disciples messed up that much, then you and I should get it right the very first time. Absolutely not. That's the bar we set for ourselves. If I can't get 100% right, if there's, if there's no risk, then I can't go forward. Here's the thing. Responsibility does not mean there's no risk. Let me say that again because a lot of times we say, well, I'm just trying to be responsible. Responsibility does not mean there's no risk. I'm not saying just like fly by to see your pants and don't take things into account and don't consider consequences. I'm not saying that, but when it comes to God's kingdom, God wants us to risk. That's what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things we don't see. If you can't see it, there's a risk, right? God wants us to risk. God wants us to try things. He knows we're going to fail, and that doesn't worry him. I love talking with different guys on the team or different guys I get to serve with. They're like, oh, man, I messed that one up. And they're just beating themselves up, beating themselves up. One of my favorite things to say to them and to say to myself when I'm in this spot sometimes is, you know what? You're not that important. Here's what I mean. You might have messed up, but God's bigger than your mistake and I don't think you just ruin someone's salvation because of your mistake. You're not that important. Like, you can't, you can't screw anything up that bad that someone all of a sudden is not going to follow Jesus anymore. Like, man, if you're trying, again, with a pure heart, if you're being good and faithful, trying to be fruitful with your life, man, you're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. That doesn't scare God. God's big enough to handle our mistakes. The failure is when we don't try. The failure is when we just stay paralyzed and say, well, I... I buried it. Here's what you gave me. God said, I didn't give it to you to bury and just to keep protected for yourself. I gave it to you to invest, to pour in to the lives of others. I want to talk about the master for just a moment before we close. Think about this story in terms of money. It's like, wow, the master's kind of greedy, right? But I want you not to think about it in terms of money. I want you to think about it in terms of people. See, the the master wants every single person, our master, Jesus, wants every single person on this planet to know him because he's created us with that design in mind to be in relationship, to be loved by him. That's his heart. So we apprentice, we pour into others, we multiply because the master wants everyone to know him, not because he needs more money in his pockets. That's just the analogy in this story, right? Right? He wants people to know him, so we step out. Jesus came, lived a perfect, sinless life, willingly laid down his life. No one took it from him. He willingly laid it down, allowed himself to be killed, rose from the grave to defeat sin and death, to wipe every mistake clean from your slate and everyone else's slate. He wants people to believe in him, to know him, and so that's why. Multiplication is so near and dear to God's heart and should be to ours as well. Because we want everyone to know him. That's why we're going to wrap up our time together by taking communion. To remember who God is and his heart towards us. So I'm going to ask the communion team to come forward now. And as they do, would you take one of each, the bread, the cup, hold on to them for a moment. We'll take communion together here in just a few minutes. I want to come back to something I said earlier that your view of God, your view of God determines your response to the expectation of multiplication. Again, if you and I are scared to fail and think that if we, if we fail that God's done with us, then this, this conversation terrifies us. But if we view God as a good and loving dad who knows that we're going to bump and scrape our knees and make mistakes and make a mess of things, 
And man, we are free to go and mess some things up this week. Not on purpose, right? But we're trying in our best efforts. No, we're not going to get it perfect. God's okay with that. So you don't have to have an accurate view of God to be able to walk into this part of our lives, walk into multiplication with confidence, with boldness, with freedom. Man, not, not being afraid to mess up or knowing if you do mess up, it's going to be okay. That is freedom. God wants us to be free. So I have a couple questions I want you to just process as we prepare our hearts for communion. First one is this, where has God's faithfulness been present in your life? And how does that impact your faithfulness? Here's what I mean. Where have you seen God come through in your life? Where have you seen God meet you where you're at and say, I see all your mistakes, all your failures, everything you've done. I love you. I accept you. I want to know you. You are mine. Would you allow the way God accepts you and meets you in that way to breathe hope, to breathe faith, to breathe courage into your willingness to step out and take steps of faith, to take some risks, to be faithful, knowing that faithfulness really means being fruitful with the opportunities that God's given you. That's the next question. What are the gifts, skills, resources, or opportunities God has entrusted to you? I encourage you, even write, write a list. Brag on yourself a little bit. Like seriously, all of us can probably use a little bit more of that. And if you have a hard time, think about, ask your spouse, ask, ask a friend, ask a sibling, ask a, a roommate, a coworker, someone who knows you well, someone in your connect group. That's why we talk about, man, God's made us for relationships because all of us have blind spots sometimes to how God's made us, how he's wired us. We don't know what we're gifted at. We don't know what comes natural to us. When someone sees you, it's like, are you kidding me? Man, the way you are with your kids, that's amazing. The patience you have, the way you, you discipline them, but you do it from a spot of love. Like God's made you that way. And you might be like, oh, I just thought that was normal because it just kind of feels natural to you. Or you, someone says, you know, man, the way you handle your finances, like the way you budget and you're, you're generous towards God and towards people around you, but you steward well with God's keep, like, man, that is a gift from the Lord. And God wants to use that to sow into someone else's life. Man, the way you love kids in our, in our kids' room, man, the way that it doesn't matter how loud the kid is screaming, you're just willing to, to sit with them, to read a story, to, to help them calm down. That's a gift. Man, the way you serve, you pour out your heart. doesn't matter who's watching or what the product is. You just, and you're blessed by that. You don't see it as a burden. You see it as a blessing. God's gifted you with his heart to serve. And then lastly, how does an accurate view of God motivate you to use these things for his kingdom? Again, when you see God as good, when you see God's heart, that every person on this planet would know him, love him, experience his goodness. How does knowing that about God encourage you, motivate you to use everything he's given you for his kingdom? So I want to give you a moment between you and the Lord just to talk with him about these things right now. about to, to take together communion. I think an it's an amazing picture and I'm hoping an encouragement to all of us. See, Jesus himself led the way in this conversation. Here's what I mean by that. If he calls us to take steps of faith, to recognize, hey, there's gonna be risk involved and we're gonna not know the guaranteed outcome of how things are gonna go. Jesus himself willingly laid down, he sacrificed his life, not knowing if you would choose to accept him. There was no guarantee there. He sacrificed his life for you in the hope that you would accept his sacrifice on your behalf. That's, that's some crazy risk right there. Now on the night that he was betrayed, when 
one of the 12 had already agreed to betray him. The other 11 were about to desert him. They shared a meal, and during that meal, he took bread, he broke it, and gave it to them. So this is my body, which is given for you when you do this. Remember me. Go ahead and take and eat. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant established between God and his people, confirmed by my blood. When you drink, remember me. Go ahead and drink and remember Jesus. I want to invite all of us to respond together today. And I recognize there's all of us are probably different spots in this response today. If you're here today and it's maybe for the first time, or maybe it's not the first time you're hearing it, but it's the first time it's really sinking down into your heart that there is a God who made you, who loves you, who wants to know you, who knows the mistakes, the past, the failures, all of it, and what you're going to fall short in in the future. And he's not scared by it. He says, yeah, I know. I'll take all that. I want you. And you want to respond. You want to accept that invitation to know the God who made you and loves you. In a moment we stand and sing, we'll have a team in the back that would love to talk with you and pray with you and help you process this very first step in that relationship called baptism. Where you go underwater symbolizes that the old life, where you were in charge, you were calling the shots, the old life is, is gone, is buried. But then you come up out of the water, a new creation, living this new life, surrender to Jesus, trusting that his leadership it's best for you. We've got everything you need to take that step today. Shirts, shorts, towels, the tank is full, everything. We'd love to talk with you and celebrate with you today. In a moment, we'll also, we'll have group leaders and, and elders and, and some of our staff up front. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you. Because I recognize, man, this fear of failure has paralyzed so many of us and kept us from the spot of even trying. And I know every single one of us want to stand before Jesus someday and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. So would you come and allow someone to pray with you, pray over you, pray faith and courage into you to grow past these fears and insecurities. So would you stand with me now? I'm gonna pray. When I say amen, that's your cue to head to the back for baptism or to come forward for prayer. Let's respond together. Let me pray. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you that you were willing to surrender your life. God, to sacrifice your life, God, to, to really to, to, to take a step of faith, which is almost crazy to, to say, God, but knowing that you didn't, you didn't have the assurance, God, that you took a step of faith that we would, we would accept you, God, that we would believe you, God, that we would place our hope and our trust in you, God. So would you, God, just build our faith and our courage, God, through your example. God, would you help us to just embrace and to get excited about this expectation of multiplication, God. I believe that you're gonna equip us every step of the way, God. You're not afraid of us failing. God, that every step we take that doesn't go 100% according to plan is an opportunity to learn and grow, God. So would you mold us, God? Would you shape us? Would you equip us for your kingdom and for your purposes, God? We wanna make an impact in eternity, God. We love you. We trust you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond together. You can head to the back for baptism. Come forward for prayer and let's sing.